continuing in Numbers, Joshua 14. I'm sorry, I want to be talking about Numbers in a little bit. Um, just a few things. Um, first of all, I, I don't think I'm sick, but I have allergies. Um, my fever is only 103. <laughs> So I don't think I don't think I'm infectious or anything like that. So don't be worried about me. But <coughs> if I'm using this mic in case I have to go like or like, so you understand, um, it's going to be some extra sound effects maybe within the message this morning. But I do feel good. If you are streaming us right now through YouTube, which is fine, um, you might want to switch over to GraceConnectionChurch.org. That's our website, and that's the same stream. Um, because YouTube will be cutting off right at the very end of the message because we're going to show a YouTube video. So you have, can't do both. We're going to just like whoop, wipe out the YouTube stream right at the end of the message, and you will miss the last po portion of that of the service, about four or five minutes or so, if you're watching on YouTube. Facebook will be okay. The website um, will be okay. <coughs> um, just because I get asked this a lot, if the... The um, library of the messages here and services at Grace Connection can be all logged. We have our YouTube channel. It's always on the screen in the announcements. Grace Connection TV. Grace Connect, all one word, Grace Connection TV. You just search that in YouTube, and you'll, all our stuff will come up. All the services from 10, 12 years ago, or some hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them will come up. So you can just Grace Connection TV, then subscribe. When you subscribe to that, go button subscribe. Every time we go live or something new is posted, it will give you a notification that it's posted. So Grace Connection TV, and now you can go all the way back. There's some video in there, which I have hair. <laughs> no, I think we had to know those out. I think, then, I think, then, I think we dropped those. <coughs> um, just a, um, a, f a few updates. Let me see here. I told you about that. I told you about that. <coughs> Dr. Lewis, we, um, not a whole bunch from last week. Um, he's got a long road. He is definitely stabilized, and, um, and he's looking at long-term recovery here. We're not talking about weeks. We're talking about months. Okay, so just continue to pray. There are m a multiple things he's challenging, and uh, that he's challenging him right now. So continue to pray for him, lift up his family, and and all those, and um, we'll give you updated. He's not really ready for visitors yet, but when that, when and if that time is, we'll let you know, and um, we'll we'll um, we'll let you know when it's time that he can, he can see folks and things like that. <coughs> okay, Joshua 14. We have to, oh, I'm going to read the whole chapter here in a moment because there's only 15 verses. <coughs> I don't think I would shock anybody if I with this next sentence. There is a constant battle for your thought life sort of true in it, yes. The constant battle for your thought life. I know there is for mine. There's a constant value for your values and your priorities. I mean, I, I think my, pro my priorities are right, but I find that I'm always being lured away from what is really important and what really isn't that um, important. There's a constant battle, and this is a big one, for where you will place your identity. Um, especially in our, our country. Um, is my identity going to be in a career? Is it going to be in success? Is it going to be in my physical appearance, my athletic proudness? Or is it going to be in my family? Is it, or is it going to my identity going to be placed in Christ? And sometimes it's a mix of all those things. <clears throat> I'm, as you know, I, I've been, one of the things I'm doing in my life for the last couple of years is just trying to memorize portions of Scripture. I've said it a thousand times. I'm not good at it. I'm not smart. I don't have a great recall. I'm not trying to be smart. I'm not trying to have a great recall. I'm just trying to get the word of God hidden deep in my heart. And um, one of the passages I, I, I read, and I'll be talking about this a little bit next week. Next Saturday night, I'm going to speak a message called A Counseling Session with Jesus Christ. And um, we're going to look in the New Testament and see how Jesus Christ would counsel us through some of the very things that we face in our modern day lives. But think about this verse. <clears throat> Therefore, be not anxious. I don't have it on the screen for you. Be not anxious, Matthew 6, 34. Um, anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for, an anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
Remember a few weeks ago we talked about being in the present, living in the present? So, and I, this is Jesus talking. And this whole passage is about anxiety, you know, not caring. He goes, but don't be anxious about tomorrow. Because tomorrow's going to have his own anxieties. <laughs> um, sufficient for the day is his own trouble. Be in the present, in the moment. You and Jesus now, in the present moment, this is how do you want to think? How do you want to react? See, the believer in Christ must understand and be also able to discern this world system. And this world system's relentless attack, not just necessarily on our physical lives, but our mental lives, which is after our values, after our priorities, after our identities. <coughs> it will, um, this, this world system, well, let me just get describe this a little bit. This is something we talk about a lot. I'll, I'll use the term cosmos. Um, it's um, and and world system simultaneously because cosmos is the Greek word. It's just my background just uses that term probably more than people um, even know what I'm talking about. But if I say cosmic this or cosmic that, it's just talking about the spirit of the world. That's really all I'm talking about when I use that term. Uh, the system we live is first of all, it's a, it's a system. It's not an identity. It's programmer. Second Corinthians four four is the devil, Satan himself. He programs the world system. It's evil in nature and wants to inflict and in, in, infect us and influence us with this, its agenda, this present evil age, Galatians 1, 4. Uh, the whole world lieth in wickedness, 1 John 5, 19. Those words mean an evil that wants to infect you. Not an evil within itself, even though it is evil within itself, but it's an evil that wants to enlist you into its evil. So the programmer of the world system, the devil, has, has this, evil, this evil undercurrent, this evil um, system running to, to bring you into its way of thinking, into your, its values, into its uh, fears, into its apprehensions, into the way that it wants you to think. <clears throat> and it adjusts from time to time through the ages in the, in the Bible times, let's say, and even to this in other places of the world, they may use intimidation through persecution to hinder the work of Christ, to hinder the church, right? I remember getting a call from Anila's husband um, before he passed away, and he was coming to our church to speak from Pakistan, and he was in, uh, best I remember, in Dallas, Texas, his flight landed there. He had to get on a flight and go back to Pakistan because the Taliban was raiding churches. I never thought about that. I've, if I saw a Taliban walk by me, I wouldn't know what it was. <laughs> I've never worried about anyone raiding our church. I'm not saying it won't happen someday, but I'm just, I'm just it, it's, it's not something that I ever had to confront with my level of fear in, um, in my life. So I, I think, again, from time... This world system will adjust the way it attacks God's people. How it will attack God's people in Bangladesh or Pakistan or Iraq or um, in, in Russia would be different than America. I think Americans actually face some of the greatest adversaries there is. One is called success. That's a tough adversary. Um, prosperity. I've seen many more pass the test of adversity than prosperity. Adversity makes you buckle down and focus and reprioritize and seek God. Prosperity lets you lie on your own lees and just rely upon yourself and, um, and um, just try to prosper more. Then after a while, you convince yourself, I'm doing pretty good, huh? Even maybe without God. Prosperity. Here's another one that I see that it might not be the same in other places, but it's amazing how it has prevailed and beginning to rise in America is this culture of victimhood. I'm a victim because, fill in the blank. You funny, you go to other countries that really are victims <laughs> and really do face things we would never face, and they really don't complain about it. It's just their, sort of their life. They're like, oh, well, praise the Lord. And not I'm saying they're all like that, but the ones that I talk to, they, they don't really think like, how come I was born in the third world? How come I was born in a Muslim country? 
come on, I was born. They don't, they don't really whine and complain about it. But in America, somebody didn't call me. They unfriended me on Facebook. I only got four likes on my post. I thought people liked me. My life is over. <laughs> and um, it's amazing. This culture of victimhood that we have grown in America. Now, here's an old, <clears throat> old definition. I've used this a gazillion times. There's some numerous ones I like. This is uh, Lewis Ferry Schaefer. He describes the world system uh, or the cosmos. <clears throat> okay, and again, this is about 75, 80 years old. So the language is a little bit different, just a little bit. <clears throat> and, um, but look at all the things he includes in describing the world system. <clears throat> the cosmos is the vast order. I have it on the screen. Yeah, I do. Um, the vast order of system that Satan has promoted, which conforms to his ideals and methods, aims and methods. It is civilization now functioning apart from God, a civilization in which none of his promoters really expect God to share, who assign to God no consideration in respect to their project, nor they don't ascribe any causivity to him. In other words, God doesn't exist. This system embraces its godless governments, conflicts, armaments, jealousies, its education, its culture, its religions of morality, and pride. It is the sphere in which man lives. It is what he sees and employs. And to the uncounted multitude, it is all they'll ever know so long as they live on earth. It is properly styled the satanic system, which phrased in many instances a justified interpretation of the so meaningful word cosmo. It is literally a cosmic diabolical, a satanic world system. <laughs> now, in, in, in Joshua chapter 13, the one that Stan preached about was um, no Bible, <coughs> no notes. And he just really talked about his wife, the whole, the, 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 the whole, the whole service, stuff like that. Thank you again for forgiving him. So, but, um, and, and, and we see, jo and, and I remember Stan, I was listening, and his homie, he says, Joshua is old. So it starts with that, right, Stan? Am I right? That you remember that. And then you, have your note. you didn't have your notes. You remember that. Joshua is, is old. And so we're thinking Joshua's about 80 there, because we know Caleb is about 80. Maybe he's a little older than Caleb. I don't, never knew when his birthday was. And maybe it tells you how old he was, but I, I didn't. It just says he was old. And they're driving out the enemy just like God <clears throat> had told them to. <clears throat> now we pick up verse chapter 14. <clears throat> and these are the inheritance that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which he lays out the priest and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the head of the father's houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to Inherit. Now, I just had a, 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 a rima here, a thought here. Verse 1, son of Nun, N-U-N. You think there's a relation there between Joshua and Pastor Kelly Nun? <laughs> I mean, it's spelled, it's right there. It, it's right there. I didn't make it up. That's just, I'll have to ask him about that. He's in Columbia now. I'll ask him when he comes back. Do you know anyone in your family tree named Joshua that you might remember? I don't know that. The, their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one-half tribes. For Moses had given the inheritance to the two and one-half tribes beyond the Jordan, but the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in with their pasture lands for their livestock and their substance." <clears throat> and the people of Israel did as M the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. And here's where we want to get focus a little, here a little bit. And when the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, or Jeff, whatever, the Kenizzite said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me? This conversation happened 40 years before. I'm going to read you those verses in a moment. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. I told him what I really thought. But my brothers who went up 
with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85 years old. 85, I thought it was 82 through 5 years since the last time I read this. <laughs> and I'm 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was the day that Moses sent me. I love this. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going out, going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakin were there with great fortified cities. It must it may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. <clears throat> now, if you were to go back, I'm going to read you a few verses um, later, but if you were to go back, uh, you would see that the Anakins were the giants, and they were the ones that, that feared, the Israel feared the most. So here's Joshua, 45 years later, saying, they're, they're the ones I want. Give me the Anakins. Don't give me the little guys. Give me the big guys. Give me the tough jobs with the walled cities. Give me those guys. Heck, I'm 85. I'm ready for them. I've been preparing 85 years for this. <laughs> and Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. How many of you say these names? Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the, Ken, the Ken, Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Now we go back, I guess, 45 years before in Numbers chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, we're picking up the same story he's describing. Please read Numbers chapter 14 to get the whole picture here because the whole chapter is imperative to understand the journeys of Israel. But this is what relates to Caleb. Numbers verse 23. Shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. Only Joshua and Caleb were left. Now, out of that, everyone at the age 19 and under um, survived and got a chance to go into the promised land. Everyone 20 years and older died in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb, and they were most likely in, in their 40s. We know Caleb was. But my servant Caleb, and here's what I want to look at, <coughs> because he has a different spirit. <coughs> I think the King James may say another spirit. It has followed me fully. I will bring him to the land <coughs> into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. <coughs> so I believe, my friends, um, this was not exclusive to Caleb. I believe that God is still looking for his children who had a different spirit. And what does that mean? Like you're ready to go do battle? Some, no. It just means that you're not, uh, you have the promise of God. You, you esteem the promise of God above the adversaries of God. You esteem the promise of God beyond what's confronting you. There will always be giants in the land. Satan will make sure of it, right? Do you think he'll ever make it easy? The promised land representing the New Testament finished work walk we have with God. We've said that in the very beginning of the series. Uh, but this is my New Testament. We're living in the promised land now, in a sense. Some will say it's heaven, and we can re definitely relate to that. But our, our, our seal with the Spirit to the day of redemption, walk with God. Now, the mass is controlled by fear these days. That's a big one. We saw this during COVID. Fear gripped the masses. Fear has gripped the church. The media, the spokesperson for the world system, Again, the media, the spokesperson for the world system, kept us focused on the giants, the oh no's, oh no, oh no, oh no. Or who's that little guy in Winnie the Pooh? Oh dear, oh my. Eeyore, 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 right, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh dear, oh my, it's going to be a bad day today. And, um, oh, no, um, 
There is a ten spy spirit. Used to be a song we sang in Sunday school, bus ministry about that. A ten sp- it rules believers. We can't do that. It's too hard. It's too difficult. There are giants in the land. Oh no. In other words, I could never conquer the land of my soul because I'm guilty. I could never conquer the land of my soul because I'm weak, because I have an addiction, because I'm wounded, because I'm afraid, because I have stuff in my past. There'll always be a giant trying to keep you from experiencing all which God wants you to have this side of heaven. And I'm not talking about material blessings. I'm talking about blessings of the inner life. Material blessings are wonderful when God gives them, but not everyone gets those. A lot of us can't handle them because we can't handle prosperity, right? I'm talking about the stuff in here, freedom in here, freedom from fear, freedom from my past, freedom from my woundedness. The ten spy spirit. I think the ten spy spirit is one of the reasons why the church is failing miserably in the Great Commission. I'm going to just say this. We're going to do our Easter service. We're going to talk about, to be evangelistic, about why did Jesus weep in, in John eleven thirty five. 35. But then we're going into a series for three to five weeks after, I don't know how long yet, called Sidewalk Apologetic. And we're going to give you um, tangible things that you can take your faith and share your faith with other people and answer the questions that they're asking today in the culture. Because people are asking the questions, but I'm finding out that God's people don't have the answers. And they're not, they're not like scientific, rocket science, neuroscience, um, nuclear reactor type of stuff. It's just some common sense things that we're going to just go through. We're like, why do we believe the Bible? How come we can believe it? Because God said. But that's not going to float with somebody else. You have to explain it. Why would we believe the Bible? How do we believe uh, were we created or did we evolve? Where did the T-Rex come from? <laughs> and all those significant questions. So we're going to talk about those things. And now, <clears throat> now, the ten spies forgot, if you go back to nu- um, Numbers, they, they forgot about the faithfulness of God. Think with me. They had just seen the plagues of God in Egypt, right? You know, within the, all their lifetimes. They saw what God did with all the plagues. They saw how God got them out of Egypt. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw the pillar of fire by night. They saw water in a rock. They saw the Egyptian army getting um, slaughtered by God in the Red Sea. And then they go in. They send the spies in. They send there's giants in the land. Oh, Oh, no. There's giants in the land. Well, the Egyptians were giants, right? They, God did them okay, handled them okay. The Red Sea was a giant, right? That, came, that worked out fine, right? So why are we afraid of those giants? And some of that was because the ten spies, there was 12, Joshua and Caleb were two, and then there was ten others. Um, they acted like God didn't exist. How many of us sometimes approach life as though God does not exist, even though we confess that he does? That somehow he is not in control, that somehow he is not able to meet me at my deepest place, that he is not capable of coming through in this particular moment, the situation of my life. How many of us take the promises of God, which we'll see in a little bit, and put them on a shelf, when we're faced with the giants of life. And your giants and my giants and our multitude of giants are going to be different for everybody. So I want to go back a little bit to chapter 9 and 10 because Dr. Lewis actually preached on this um, and when I was away in, in um, February. <clears throat> but I wanted to revisit this whole account again because it is so compelling to me. Now, this is the account of the Gibeonite deception. As you know, the Gibeonites were a, H- a Hivite tribe. They dressed in old clothes. They, they, they made their appearance look aged on purpose. They flattered Israel into a false covenant. When you made a covenant with, as, an Isra- as an Israelite, it was like a, a, a covenant with God. It was not something that you could break. 
Um, and so the Israelite honored. They said, we come from a faraway land outside of what God promised them. So they made a covenant that they're gonna, never going to fight and they're going, they're going to be friends. And so it turns out, shortly at, thereafter, they realized that um, they lied. The Gibeonites lied to them. They tricked Joshua into thinking they were far away, when in reality they were only about 20 to 25 miles away. So here's Joshua. Now, if I'm Joshua, in my common sense, in the way I would relate to this, I'm saying, well, that agreement I made with you was null and void because it was based upon false pretenses. You lied to me. I would never have agreed to this if you didn't lie. I made this agreement, but you lied to me. So Joshua, no, that agreement, we, we made that agreement. So Gibeonites went back to their place. Then five Amorite kings said, look at the Gibeonites are hanging out with the Israelites. And I don't like that. We better march on Gibeon now. And so they put five alliance um, kings, cities came together, and they started marching on Gibeon. And so they sent the message to Joshua and said, you know, these bad guys are coming. They're marching on us. We made a covenant, remember? So what did Joshua do? I mean, think about that. What gall is that? <laughs> I just ripped somebody off, and I go back to them and say, can I rip you off again? <laughs> it takes a lot of gall to do that. He goes, I just lied to you. You mind fighting for me now and shedding your blood because I just, even though I just lied to you? I mean, that's, that's some moxie. That's some chutzpah that, that, that's come up with that. You think about that. So, so go, Joshua says, oh, I can just put myself down. Big Gibeonites. All right, guys, strap on your gear. Armor up. We're going to Gibeon to fight for the Gibeonites. But Joshua, they don't even believe in the God of Israel. I know. Joshua, they, they lied to us. I know. Joshua, they are using us. Yeah, I know. Why are we doing that? Because we promised. And God doesn't ever go back on his promise. So they marched overnight, all night. They're fighting. They're winning. <clears throat> the day is beginning to get older. The, the, the five Amorite kings are, are fleeing. And they've killed a bunch of them already. And then God starts going, okay, it's getting dark out. It's getting late. You guys are tired. I'm going to help out a little bit. And start sending the Air Force in. Hailstones. Starts hill, hill, big old hailstones. Starts picking off the Amorites one by one. And it says more, the hailstones killed more people than the soldiers killed in the battle. You think of that. First of all, I'm not sure how the battle was lined up, but many of you are in this room like this, we're all fighting with swords, clang, clang, clang. And what's the hailstones just like, pew, just pick out, <laughs> just, there's like sniper fire. They, they, they just picked off the, the bad guys and wiped out more of the Amorites than the Israelites did. But that still wasn't enough time. The battle was still raging. So, so they, God stopped the sun. 12, 24 hours. He stopped the sun. So they could continue battling. He stopped the course of nature for this unbelieving nation that lied to him and lied to his people because he gave his word. He promised them that he would defend them. And he was never going to be wrong and never fail on his promise because not one promise of God will ever fall to the ground. Now, let's just stop that story there and fast forward 430 years. Think how long that is. That's older than America. 430 years, there's a drought in Israel. David can't figure out why. He seeks the Lord, and he's told it's because Saul violated the covenant I made with the Gibeonites 430 years ago. That's why there's a drought in the land. You fix that, and it'll start raining again. God saw it as a violation of the cheating of this lying, unbelieving nation. Because God's promise, he goes, I promised them. You think most of Israel even remembered that? 
there's probably some record of it. They understood it, but no one was probably thinking about the Gibeonites 430 years ago. They, and by that point, the two cultures had blended in and were doing just fine living together. But God never forgot the time frame. Uh, the authority of the promise was still in full effect. I won't preach that much longer. This is why Caleb had a different spirit. And this is what a different spirit is. He trusted in the promise of God, despite others, despite circumstances, despite others' doubts, despite what facts might have told him. He just believed in the promise of God. And the promise of God had no time limit. The promises of God that we read in our New Testament and our Bible, some of them thousands of years old, are still in full effect today. God is still reliable to his word back then as he is today. And that's, I think, the thing that separates believers. This is what makes a believer a different believer. They take the promise of God and say, that's going to be my life. That's what I'm going to believe. That's going to guide me. That's going to be my confession. That's going to influence my decisions. That's going to influence my relationship of these promises. Second Peter 1, 3, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. We just covered these verses in the last year. Through, through the knowledge, epinosis of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he granted to us his precious and very great promises that through them, those precious and very great promises, through them, we might, we might become partakers of this divine nature. That's in the here and now. That's experientially. I'm a partaker of his divine nature. I am positionally, absolutely, like we said last night, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful nature. So how do I become a partaker of his divine nature? Well, I'm already sealed with the Spirit, 130, 113 and 430 of Ephesians. But right in the here and now, I partake of his divine nature through the, the great and precious promises of God. For all the promises of God, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, um, 19 and 20, really, um, promise God, you find their yes in him, or yea and amen. That is why through him that we may utter amen to God for his glory. So we say yes to the promises of God, and who gets the glory for it? Not us, God. See, it takes a, a different spirit to believe in God's promises. Spirit of Caleb. David had a different spirit when he looked at Goliath and said, I can take this guy. Why? Because I believe in the God of Israel. I know I'm just a boy, but I believe in the God of Israel. He had a different spirit. Abraham had a different spirit when he packed up his family and he moved because God just told him to on a promise that God was going to make his seed, uh, his uh, in, uh, his descendants innumerable. Elijah had a different spirit when he went up to Mount Carmel and took on 400 prophets of Baal, vastly outnumbered, um, confronting King Ahab. He had a different spirit because he had the promises of God behind him. Mary and Joseph, they had a different spirit because they believed in the promise of God, even though it didn't make any sense. You're going to conceive to a virgin. And then Joseph says, right, you got pregnant by... What? Explain this to me. But they believed. They had a different spirit. See, I need to have a different spirit if I'm going to believe in Psalm 56, verse 9, God is for me. I need to have a different spirit if I'm going to believe that God will never waste my pain in Romans 8, 28. I need a different spirit if I'm going to believe that in 1 Kings 8, 56, not one word of God, not one promise will ever fall to the ground. I need a different spirit when I look at Hebrews 13, 5, and it says, I'll know never, no, never, no, never. So this is in the original language, three times, triple negative. I'll know never, no, never, no, never leave thee or forsake thee. Talking about financial resources. I believe it because God said it. I need a different spirit to believe I'm perfectly righteous before God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 
He sees me as perfect. He sees me without fault, blemish, spot, wrinkle, or any such thing in Ephesians 5.27. Believe it. That I'm a new creation and Christ dies. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. Believe it. That's true. That death has no sting in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Believe it, it has no sting. The fear of death is gone in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. There's a mansion being built for me in heaven in, a, in um, John 14, 6. And the moment I die, I'll be pr I'm present with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. Do you believe it? It's a promise of God. That's what gives us a different spirit. We're going to face large and diverse giants in our life. I'm not going to willpower my way through them. I'm going to believe the promises of God that they're true. And they have to be true. If they're not true, then we of all men are most miserable. And that's what gives me my strength. That's what allows me to face the giants that we have hanging on to these precious and pleasant promises. Be not anxious for tomorrow, Jesus said. Don't be anxious. You know, today's evil is sufficient for today. Tomorrow, we'll deal with tomorrow when it gets here. I'm making you a promise. There's Amalekites in all of our neighborhood. There's stuff in my soul that I need to confront and that's never, that needs to go. There's insecurities, there's fears, there's lust, there are addictions, there are um, apprehensions, there's victimhood, there's, there's stress, all these things, these giants that just take up residence in the promised land of my soul that Jesus Christ has set free through the Holy Spirit. Listen, we can't willpower out. You hang on to these precious and pleasant promises. And you confess them, you repeat them, you rehearse them, you tell the devil, remind the devil of them. And you'll find that they capture the land. They take back the land that sometimes we lost. Spurgeon said this, and I'll close. I have a video for you. But there is nothing which one saint was, and this is very old language, that you may not be. There is no elevation of grace, no attainment of spirituality, no clearness of assurance, no post of duty, which is not open to you if you have the power to believe. So lay aside your sackcloth and ashes and rise to the dignity of your true position. You are little in Israel because you will be so, not because there's any necessity for it. It is not meet that you should grovel in the dust, O child of king, of the king, a sentence. Spurgeon. These promises, my friends, will give us a different spirit. Mm.